I'm sure I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about the future of OpenZFS on FreeBSD uh, and try to make everybody feel better about that. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, so my name is Alan Ju. I'm uh, on the FreeBSD core team and an OpenZFS developer uh, for fun and then uh, as much fun as that can be. Uh, and then for my day job, I run Clara, which is a FreeBSD professional services and support company. So if you want to contract ZFS development or support, that's who you should talk to. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. Uh, first is a bit about OpenZFS, how it started, how it's evolved, and what it's going to look like in the future. And then we'll talk about some of the challenges that have come up over time, and then how changing the upstream uh, of FreeBSD's version of ZFS, how that will happen, and what we will gain from it, and why it's not as scary as it sounds. And then finally, uh, where OpenZFS will take us in the future. Uh, so, quick recap at the beginning. Uh, ZFS was originally developed at Sun Microsystems starting in, what, 2001 or so? Uh, and then that became open source under the CDDL license in about 2005. Uh, and in about 2007, it got ported to FreeBSD, and in 2008, work started on porting it to Linux. Uh, but sadly, in 2010, Oracle bought Sun and ruined it. Um, <laughs> and they closed down uh, their version. So future development uh, on ZFS was no longer going to be open source. And so FreeBSD didn't have a source to get new ZFS from. Uh, but we weren't the only people that had picked up ZFS, and the Alumos project was started to get to carry forward uh, the ideas of an open source version of Solaris, and so we weren't the only people stranded on this island. <laughs> and so we built a raft. Uh, so OpenZFS was then uh, started by Matt to try to keep things going and to try to keep, you know, ZFS to mean the same thing across all those platforms. Uh, so the Kind of original uh, goal or idea behind OpenZFS is that someday we could have this one repo that would have ZFS in it, and everybody would send their changes there, and then everybody else would pull from there, and it would be great. Uh, but and then each OS could pull down the ZFS code, and then locally have their changes to, to integrate with uh, that. Where on FreeBSD, that's the Open Solaris layer where we. Uh, change the OpenSolaris APIs that ZFS uses into the analogous thing on FreeBSD. Um, and the same thing would happen, you know, the Solaris porting layer on Linux and so on. Uh, yeah. However, the effort to maintain a repo uh, of only the agnostic code that nobody would actually be able to use necessarily uh, was kind of high and nobody was, you know, chopping at the bit to volunteer to maintain the thing that nobody would actually use per se. I mean, uh, we had this idea of we'll be able to do all the tests in the user space, and we'll be able to test it all, and it'll be great. Uh, and it would have been, but it was also a lot of work that nobody really was volunteering to do. Uh, so uh, at that point, we just declared that the repo of record would be uh, this open ZFS repo on GitHub, which was a copy of the Alumos repo. Uh, and eventually, that was opened up so that you could do uh, PRs and, and uh, pull requests and issues against it, um, and people from Matt's team would carry that back to Alumos and do the, the kind of RTI process that obviously FreeBSD and Linux developers weren't really familiar with. Uh, but FreeBSD tracked that repo very closely. Uh, you know, we could every time a bug fix or a new feature to ZFS within that repo, it could be pulled into FreeBSD. Uh, a couple of years ago, in a talk similar to this, I talked about the latency we had sometimes, which uh, I think the record was a feature landed in OpenZFS and was in FreeBSD within 14 hours. It was in head. And I think even the worst case, I think one time was about 90 days when the new feature required some support code in FreeBSD that didn't exist uh, until I went and wrote, a, well, modified Collins implementation of SHA-256 and 512 to make a SHA-512 truncated version for ZFS to use. Uh, 
Um, and so over the time, the number of platforms has also grown. Uh, OpenZFS, you know, we have the Illumos repo, which is used to make OmniOS and Open Indiana, SmartOS and Triplex and Deltix OS and so on, and was ported to FreeBSD, which makes FreeNAS and ZigmaNAS and TrueOS and PFSense and lots of other operating systems. Uh, and then NetBSD ported the FreeBSD version of ZFS to NetBSD. And then the ZFS on Linux repo, uh, which is used in Ubuntu and Proxmox and a bunch of other things, uh, pulled from Illumos. And then the Mac OS and Windows ports of ZFS uh, pulled from that repo. And so we had sometimes really weird chains of the arrows, which way the code went, were all over the place. <laughs> uh, but things have changed a bit since then. Uh, but then we started having the problem of ZFS not really being the same on each different platform. Uh, so the first thing to solve that was instead of using the monotonically increasing version number, if you remember ZFS originally on FreeBSD, we had you know, V17, and then we went to like V22 or something, and then to 25, 28. Uh, that didn't make sense in a case where a new feature might be in one new feature might be in Linux first, and then Illumos, and another feature in Illumos first, and then FreeBSD. Uh, so Matt just declared, we'll just call it version 5000, and we'll have feature flags to indicate each feature and whether your system supports it or not. Uh, and that's worked much better, is more meaningful to uh, a human than the version number as well. I think going back, right, here's the features I have and the features I don't by name rather than Oh, was it V30 or V33 that they added LZ4 compression? I don't remember. Um, but we also had the problem of bugs were fixed in one repo and not necessarily upstream, you know, especially when it was maybe a tiny thing, uh, or that the, each development camp kind of worked on their thing and, you know, the FreeBSD people weren't necessarily familiar with what was happening uh, over in the most repo or the Linux repo or even just the discussions that happened around the command. Uh, that provided context and so on. Actually, one I ran into was the um, ZFS user space command, which lets you uh, look at a data set and see how much space is used by each different username. Uh, but it does, using ZFS's internal space accounting, it can do this nearly instantaneously, whereas doing something like find DU or whatever could take you know, hours to, to sum up all that metadata. Uh, well, a bug was found where if a UID that owns a file doesn't map to a username, the user space command only ever prints the first one of those. So if you uh, happen to be like Clusterman was doing last night, trying to figure out whose fault it is that the home dirs on Freefall are 1.4 terabytes, uh, and we run the report, and the only names listed are the members of Clusterman. Like, there are hundreds of more usernames than that. That's can't do, right? And then we remember, oh, we're running on the host, not in the jail, so we don't actually have, the usernames don't exist on the machine we're running the command on. Uh, and so I remembered hearing about this fix when it went into Linux. But it turns out the fix to this bug was committed to the ZFS on Linux repo in 2016, uh, but it's still yet to be pulled into FreeBSD. But I have the diff on my laptop now because I compiled the version of ZFS with the fix for us to do the report last night. <laughs> <laughs> It turns out it's Robert Watson's fault. <laughs> but he's allowed, so we blame the second person on the list. Uh, but things like that happened, and you know, that was a small fix, and, but you know, if you're a Linux developer, you just don't know anybody in FreeBSD, how do you tell them about this? Uh, and that's another problem that we solved later. Uh, so to start to deal with this, and also uh, other things, Matt started the OpenZFS Developer Summit, which was basically a, a yearly meeting, kind of like something at uh, the, the FreeBSD Developer Summit at BSD Camp, where people working on ZFS could all come together for a day and present what they were working on, and eventually it even grew a second day where we have a mini hackathon, where people can work on prototypes of new features with all the other domain experts in the room. It makes it much easier to ask questions about you know, if I want to do this, where do I need to look? Or, you know, when I was working on the Z standard feature, I was like, I have this problem that I haven't figured out how to solve. Uh, and after presenting it, uh, 
two different developers came up to me with the same solution as it turned out, but the right solution as well. Um, anyway, the first OpenZFS uh, Dev Summit included a platform panel where they had people from each of the different platforms that existed then, which was the ports to Linux, Mac, Lumos, and FreeBSD, uh, to talk about the different issues on different platforms, and a, a vendor lightning talk to people building products on ZFS to kind of just so everybody would be aware of what everybody else was doing. Uh, that first developer summit had about 30 people, uh, whereas nowadays we get to about 100, which I think is the cap for the space we have. Ish. A little bit bigger, but that's yeah. about the size. Yeah. Uh, and now we have that hackathon that I mentioned. Uh, but also, uh, for example, last year at that hackathon, uh, I had proposed the idea of having per VDEV properties, and so uh, five or six of us went in one meeting room and, and worked out the details of that trying to figure out if we actually want that to be per VDEV or per disk, and would we have inheritance, or would that just invite trouble? Uh, and then what, what happens to those properties when you replace that disk with a new one, and how do we deal with that? So being able to do that in a room one afternoon was very valuable. Uh, but also, uh, last year at the Dev Summit, we decided that maybe meeting only once a year wasn't enough. Uh, so we added the monthly ZFS leadership call, uh, and basically once a month we get people from all the platforms and anybody who's interested really uh, on a conference call and we discuss some of the issues, uh, including, you know, we uh, decided we need to come up with a deprecation policy and, um, you know, a bunch of other ones that are on the next slides. Uh, but it's once a month. Uh, it gives a much higher bandwidth than the mailing list, uh, and you know it's more accessible than you know everybody has to fly to California, <laughs> which is still great to do once a year. Uh, but you know this is easier. Uh, and the goal is to try to keep the platforms better in sync. Uh, even just for example, I said how the Mac OS port is based on the ZFS and Linux port. Well, after they commit a feature. If there are follow-up commands that fix bugs in it, it's important that the downstreams know about those and make sure they can pull those in as well so they don't accidentally ship the version missing those bug fixes and so on. Uh, and so having that communication has been very valuable. And uh, the live stream is live streamed during the call and it's also recorded, so you can watch them on the OpenZFS YouTube channel. Uh, so even if you miss it, it's available uh, to watch after. Uh, and there have been quite a few good outcomes from that so far. Uh, they've been very successful. And uh, one of the things we talked about was trying to standardize some of the command line interfaces because things have kind of been bolted on on different platforms. And we want to make sure that, you know, when you learn the ZFS command, it works the same on all the different platforms. Uh, and we've also been doing a better job of discussing new features during the design phase and early enough before it's hard to change things uh, so that we can uh, deal with platform specific issues ahead of time and make sure that features are considering what, when this gets ported to the other OS, uh, you know, it, what different flexibility might we need uh, and things like that uh, with better results. And we've also been talking about uh, tunables and naming of tunables and things like that, for example, a shift is actually an internal implementation detail and not something the end user really should, was meant to ever have to think about. But <coughs> disks lie and we've had to deal with this, but maybe we should actually expose that as a pool property called sector size or something like that and have it specified in bytes instead of powers of two that <coughs> the user thinks is just a magic number rather than understanding that it's actually uh, four kilobytes or whatever. Uh, and then after 18 or so years, we found the first feature we'd like to remove from ZFS. But how do we do that? How do we deal with the fact that OSs have shipped uh, a version of ZFS long-term support uh, that's going to have this feature and that it's not going to be safe to remove it? And uh, in particular, the full feature we're looking to get rid of is the deduplicated send feature. Uh, which many people confuse with deduplication in the, at the pool level, and this is completely unrelated. It only avoids sending the same data over the network, but on the receive side, there's no deduplication. It's just to save 
bandwidth on the network when you're sending data that might contain duplicates. Uh, so we decided we wanted to get rid of that, but then we had to figure out how much, how big of a warning period do we need to give people? And in this case, we had we decided we have to have a uh, rehydration tool or something. So if you the the promise that ZFS makes is that if you have a send stream from an older version, you'll always be able to receive it on the newer one. So if you have a deduplicated send stream that you've written to one of Dan's tapes and aren't going to read back for five years, uh, well, that feature doesn't exist anymore five years from now. You still need to be able to receive that send. So ZFS is going to need to include a tool that will rehydrate that send and turn it back into a regular send without the deduplication feature so that you can still receive it into your new pool. Um, because that's the promise that uh, a send stream will always be receivable. Uh, we also looked at removing the ditto, ditto feature. Uh, I don't know that many people have heard of this one, but if you are using ditto, which you should, um, <laughs> then <laughs> the idea is that if a block has been ditto many times because that same block is used a lot, so if it has, I think, is it a hundred or a thousand references? If you set it to what you want, oh. but uh, the lowest setting is a hundred. Yeah. So if a, if one block has been in use by more than a hundred copies of the file somewhere, maybe we want to keep more than one copy of that block. Uh, and so it would write a, a ditto block, a second copy of that file for each 100 references in DU. Uh, but it turns out that that didn't actually work quite that way. I think it was Resilver and Scrub didn't check it properly. So uh, if you replace the failed disk and it scrubbed, it wouldn't, the, the replacement copy wouldn't have the, the ditto block. And so the second copy wasn't actually good. And Scrub didn't check it, so you wouldn't know it wasn't good. So that's not good. <laughs> uh, and it's probably not worth fixing because most people don't use ddo and basically of those people, even fewer use this feature. So it probably makes more sense to just can it instead. Uh, should update this slide because maybe we aren't going to do this actually. But uh, we've also been discussing removing the ability to turn off the compressed arc, uh, meaning that you would always use the compressed arc. Uh, because it turns out that's not something many people do, although there are some people. I, on Linux, it was found that it would actually crash the machine. Uh, and that condition existed for a long time and no one reported it, probably because nobody was doing it. Uh, but there are a few people that are using it. Uh, so we're still considering the impact there. But one of the reasons we're considering removing that is because um, of its interaction with the L2 arc. And it's kind of holding back the idea of, of having uh, being able to update the compression algorithms that we do use in ZFS to newer versions. Uh, so there's a newer version of LZ4 that decompresses about 20% or 30% faster on AMD64, and we'd like to have that. It happens to also compress a little bit better too, uh, but that means that blocks will no longer compress to the same checksum if you use the newer version. And so we're trying to sort out how that'll work and being able to coordinate that across the platforms and being able to get a better idea of, is anybody actually using this bit of the code? Uh, having the leadership call has been a very helpful threat, even if it's just the people that watch it later and can then get in contact. Uh, another effort that Josh Petzl is actually uh, in charge of right now uh, is trying to make it easier to specifically create a pool on your platform such that it'll be compatible on other platforms. Uh, I think today if you create a, a new ZFS pool on ZFS on Linux 0.8, uh, it'll have one or two feature flags that don't work on FreeBSD. And so you may accidentally create a pool that you can't import on your other computer. And manually turning uh, feature flags on and off during pool creation is a bit of a cumbersome interface right now. Uh, so one of the proposals is that you could just say uh, you know, zpool create with uh, feature flags equals 20, uh, OpenZFS 2019, meaning 
the set of flags that are available on all of the supported platforms as of January 1st of 2019. And we would add a new one every year. Uh, and maybe we could even go to, you know, I want to create a pool that will be compatible with FreeBSD 12 or something. Although I don't know how we're going to decide how to keep that list of flags from getting egregiously long. Uh, but sorting out something so that there's an easier interface to say, I want to create a pool that's going to work on any machine, or I want to create a pool that's got the newest, latest, and greatest features, or whatever. And part of this is also changing the, the nag screen you get uh, from ZPool status, saying, oh, there's new features, you should turn them on right away. Uh, maybe we have this so that it won't nag you if you're already up to the compatibility level that you're targeting. Uh, so that's the part that some people have been afraid of. Uh, over time, uh, more and more of the development and new features has been shifting to the ZFS on Linux repo, uh, away from the Illumos repo, as that's where more people are currently working on ZFS. Um, but for FreeBSD, because our repo is, is directly in line with the Illumos one, every time there's a commit in Illumos, we can just bring it over to FreeBSD uh, you know, convert anything that's different, solve merge conflicts, and it's, it's ready to work on FreeBSD. But because the ZFS on Linux repo doesn't have a shared history uh, with FreeBSD, I mean, we never, it, it doesn't have, there wasn't a point in time where its repo looked anything like the FreeBSD repo, whereas the FreeBSD repo took a copy of the Lumos and moved, or open Solaris at the time, and then moved forward on it. Uh, so it meant importing individual features was much more difficult. I tried to copy over the uh, multi-mount protection feature from ZFS on Linux, which is a relatively small feature. Uh, but the first bits of it were committed. And then they pulled in from uh, Illumos the rewrite of the ZPool import process that made it better. Uh, and then they did another commit to the MMG feature. So when trying to grab those commits and bring them over to FreeBSD, you get all these merge conflicts from because uh, the FreeBSD repo is all in the after the rewrite of the ZPool import phase. Uh, and trying to unwind it all was very difficult. And that was a small feature. Trying to pull in something like the uh, encryption, I don't know how <laughs> they managed to do it. <laughs> yeah, they spent months on it, and then it they decided that maybe the right thing to do is to just grab the whole ZFS on Linux repo and port that back to FreeBSD, reusing the open Solaris compatibility stuff we already have and keeping lots of the VFS tweaks and stuff that we have, but just reporting it all would be a lot easier and leave us in the situation where our repo has this shared point in time that we can just, from forward from there, we can just pull commits in one at a time like we have been, and it's worked very well for us. Uh, the main advantage to doing this is that we'll be able to pull those features when they land in the ZFS and Linux repo in a matter of hours or days, whereas currently we have to wait for them to get back to a Lumos, uh, and somebody has to do the work and deal with a lot of those same complications of cherry picking those features back, and then we can pull it in, and that could be a really long time on the order of years even sometimes. Uh, for example, the ZNS user space fix was committed in 2016 and still hasn't arrived in FreeBSD. Uh, so the, the big lift was undertaken to report that and the original call for testing went out sometime last month, uh, but there's a newer one that's rebased forward and has the improvements to the I think it was the bug in send receive for encrypted sends uh, and has the trim support. Uh, so you should definitely go check out that call for testing. It's basically a snapshot of stable 12 and one of stable 13, or 13 current, uh, with the old ZFS compiled out and the, a port of ZFS and Linux as a, a package installed. Uh, and we, before we get Further, we would like people to find any bugs or missing features. Uh, the one I found was that 
we accidentally drop the ZFS jail command and we'll have to stitch that back in. But that's not that big of a deal. So the, the first snapshot was from December. I guess the next one is from only a couple weeks ago, right, Chris? Yes. Okay. Uh, and this will give us a much more minimal diff, and it'll be easier to pull in new stuff. Uh, so, of course, as soon as you announced that we're going to switch our upstream to ZFS on Linux, lots of people were uh, worried about what that meant. Uh, but as it turns out, this is open ZFS. There is only one open ZFS. It's still the same code for actual ZFS. Uh, we just, it just happened to be a slightly newer version that has more features, most of these which we really would like to have. Um, so the advantage to us is that we get the new features sooner and we get more involved in upstream. Uh, so the Linux version already does the same thing we do of using uh, some kind of Solaris porting layer. To ch so the ZFS code uses the Solaris APIs to interface with the kernel and then in both Linux and FreeBSD, we just have a layer that translate those into the analogous FreeBSD or Linux kernel calls. Uh, so it means that there's no, not really any Linux specific code in uh, that ZFS and Linux repo. It all lives in their Solaris uh, porting layer, which we will just use our version of that instead. So importantly, uh, there's no Linux KPI used uh, in the ZFS code. So it's not like the graphics drivers code where we just hold in the Linux version and, and use the Linux KPI to be able to run the Linux code on FreeBSD, this is still going to be the same native FreeBSD APIs in use in the end. And it, so it does mean that there won't be any GPL code coming into the kernel or anything like that. There's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, but what it does mean is we actually are getting to the original idea of OpenZFS that we originally envisioned. Uh, so gracefully, uh, uh, the people from ZFS and Linux have agreed to allow us to then upstream our changes, including all the if def FreeBSD bits and so on, into their repo. So what we'll do is there'll be a, an OS directory in that repo, and there'll be one directory with all the FreeBSD specific bits, and one directory with all the Linux specific bits, and then there'll be the ZFS directory with all the ZFS specific bits. Uh, and so there will be one set of ZFS code and then the interface layers for using it on the two different operating systems. And we're hoping in the near future that the Mac port will switch to the same thing, and then the Windows port, and then the Lumos port. And everybody will use one common repo, uh, and all of the bits will live upstream so that nobody has to manage a big local patch. Because <coughs> it turns out that's better for everyone. Uh, Partly because CI. Uh, so as part of this change, we'll get to leverage all the work that the ZFS and Linux people already did for CI. Uh, and we'll be able to use it similar to when we got the uh, GNOME project to set up a FreeBSD build bot and be able to detect when changes their committers made uh, broke on FreeBSD, they got notified within hours of their commit and had a chance to fix it. Whereas the old way it worked, they do a commit, break FreeBSD, not know it. Four months later, release that version. Two months after that, somebody from FreeBSD would port it to FreeBSD and then report a bug. So the developer's like, well, I haven't thought about that piece of code for six months. I'm not really motivated to fix that right now. Whereas if they get it an hour later, they're like, oh, I can fix that. Well, that's still fresh in my head. And so with this, we'll be able to Everything that's about to be merged into the OpenZFS repo uh, will be tested on Linux and FreeBSD, and we'll know about the problems and be able to fix them, rather than the opposite, where you know something gets done and it turns out that doesn't work on FreeBSD, but nobody finds out for a long time, and then it's FreeBSD's problem to fix. And if we keep doing that, we get further and further apart, and that's not what we want. Uh, so, one of the concerns is what about all of the FreeBSD specific stuff that exists in ZFS? Like, FreeBSD was the only ZFS with trim. Uh, well, it turns out the ZFS on Linux has adopted, or, well, 
rewrote most of the original patch from Nexenta for Illumos to add even better trim support. Uh, so now, in the newer testing image, it's newer than when I wrote these slides, uh, there's actually new trim support that you could test. Uh, and as I mentioned at lunch during the buff, uh, it has smarter queuing and the option of doing on-demand trim. So instead of trimming every time you delete files, you can do just a bulk trim of all your free space as a, a kind of a one-time on-demand operation. So if you have one of those SSDs that doesn't really like the way FreeBSD ZFS trim works, uh, you can do it every once in a while instead of constantly uh, and still get the best of both worlds that way. Uh, so while we'll lose the FreeBSD trim, we get an even better trim. So that's a positive rather than negative. Uh, the jail support, as I mentioned, uh, is currently missing, but it won't really be an issue to restore that. It's just, it doesn't exist in the ZFS on Linux repo, and so we just have to get a copy from our repo, merge it in, and then we'll send it back upstream, and it will exist there. And then the NFS v4 ACLs, uh, they don't have that on Linux, uh, but we've retained that in that OS slash FreeBSD directory, so all of that will continue to work how it has before. But I encourage everybody to go test that call for testing and find anything else that's not on this list because it's the only way we're going to find it. And if we find it sooner, we can fix it sooner. And it'll be a smoother release of FreeBSD 13 when this is the new ZFS. Or maybe we can even do it sooner in like 12.2 or something. Uh, so any questions before I get into the future stuff? I don't know the story about ACLs on Linux, so I think that was just the easiest thing to do for now, but maybe we can solve that after, I don't know. I don't know if, there's, I don't know if Linux has a way to expose those. And Linux yeah. doesn't support to NFS before ACL or any of that process. Right. Uh, but I guess if more platforms support it than don't, maybe that should be a dependent code in Linux, but that's more work. Uh, and it was easier to just do this for now. At this point, we're just trying to get it working, and then we'll sort out minor details like that after. But it's a decent question. Uh, are there instructions for testing uh, when not running the IX systems code base? I, because uh, in general, if you just, just compile without ZFS and then install the packages. So you just have to compile without ZFS and then install or build the ZFS and Linux port from the port stream. The port thing is you have to do world as well. You can't just do the kernel because you've got to get rid of the Z pool ZFS commands. So yeah, because the, the Z pool and ZFS commands use the unstable uh, libzfs and libz pool. Uh, and so the ones that are in base will not work with the ones of the port. So you need them to go away and be able to have a port. I've been trying to think of a, a nice way to have it so that you could, even when we get to integrating the, this new repo into the base version, of being able to have a zfs devel package or something that would give you the like, tip of tree of the repo to be able to experiment easily as a package. Yeah, we could just roll in a port for that. Right, just, uh, could we make sbin zpool a wrapper that uses user local bin zpool if it's there, and if not, uses the other one so that we don't have to uninstall ZFS from the base. Yeah, okay. yeah something. I, I don't know. I haven't figured out a good way to do it yet. But there might be some way we could make it so that you can just have stock for BSD and just be able to upgrade the ZFS by installing the port. Sure. If you do too much munching, it may not be a valid test. Yeah. So this is more about making it easier for people that want to work on ZFS to be able to just do it on top of regular FreeBSD. Uh, instead of having to build it all special. So the port, is the port in the FreeBSD port stream? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OS slash Zol something. I'm not seeing it. <coughs> it might not be in the quarterly branch yet, but it'll be in the port stream. What is the jail sign? What's searching for jail? Ah, so on FreeBSD, we support delegating a data set to a jail. 
Uh, so if you have a data set, you can set the jail property to on, and then that data set can never be mounted in the host system. Uh, and it doesn't work, basically. It becomes invisible, almost. Uh, and then you do ZMS jail, and then a jail name or ID, and the data set. And now root in that jail can run ZMS list, see that, and do ZMS create and makes child data sets and do anything they want to that data set. Uh, and then on the host, you can also set a quota that they won't be able to override, so they can't use all your space. And then uh, Joint added a file system limit and a snapshot limit. Uh, so as you learned in Matt's presentation, because uh, a lot of the snapshot stuff is OLAN squared, um, you might not want them to be able to create 500,000 snapshots. So you can say that you know this data set, you can do whatever you want with it, but you can't create more than 2,000 snapshots because I don't want you breaking my pool. Uh, but yes, this allows you to basically give a data set to a jail, and then inside that jail, root can do whatever it wants. Uh, we use this at scale engine because the the, the host that we give users to be able to come and upload their own files is actually a jail. Uh, but each user has their own data set in that jail. Uh, and so we delegate a data set into that jail and then have a child data set for each user. And so the script that automatically creates the users and, and creates the data sets and stuff all runs in a jail. Uh, partly because we also can then pick that whole jail up and move it to a different box if we need to do maintenance or something. Uh, or the backup, the offsite backup box has got the exact same configuration, and so we just change a DNS entry, and everybody runs off that one instead. And so having that as a container is very useful to us. So uh, they will fix that. Yes, it's mostly a matter of copying and pasting the code from the FreeBSD repo and putting it in the other one. It just doesn't exist down in Linux because they're like, we don't have that. We'll just delete it. Right. And basically, it'll become if def FreeBSD and go upstream. Other questions? All right, so then I have kind of an overview of some of the features that uh, have come recently, are coming, or have come recently, are already in the new upstream, so we'll gain when uh, Chris finishes his work, uh, and then stuff that's coming up, and then stuff that has been discussed but maybe isn't even started yet, and so on. Uh, so some of the stuff that's relatively new is the sequential scrub and resilver. Uh, so if you've ever run SQL status while doing a scrub and now it says, you know, scanned and issued as two different counters, that's the new sequential scrub. So instead of having to, instead of doing the scrub in random order, causing uh, a lot more IOPS and being very slow, the sequential scrub uh, allocates a chunk of memory, I think it's 1 32nd of the arc or something like that. Um, and starts building a range tree. So it scans in random order like it always did, going through the tree of your file system, uh, building up this range of blocks that needs to go scrub or resilver. When that range is, when the amount of memory for the range tree is full, it takes the largest contiguous range and goes and does that. Then it goes back to scanning. This way, when you're actually doing the scrub or resilver, it's doing big contiguous uh, ranges on the disk. And that turns out, especially on spinning hard drives, that's a lot faster than doing random IO. It can be the difference between single digit megabytes and hundreds of megabytes per second per disk. It makes a big difference. Uh, the ability to actually pause and resume a scrub. You've been able to cancel a scrub, but not pause it. Uh, this way, you can say, I only want my scrubs to run outside of office hours. So when, it, when office hours starts, a cron tab can pause it. And when office hours ends, it can resume it. That way, your scrub will still complete, but you won't have to uh, suffer the performance penalty during the day. How will it know to pick up where it left off if a bunch of changes have happened throughout the pool? Like, it doesn't, but it, 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 it does it the same way as it's it, it doing that continuously anyways, Yeah, essentially. Yeah, even during a normal scrub that you don't pause, the same thing can happen. Okay. Yeah, if but, it already had a pause there, I think so. Pause? No, yeah, it was canceled. That's key. Yeah, pause. This, this exists now, but it's relatively new. Like, I, I don't, was it 11.2? I don't remember what it came from. Uh, anyway, another new one was device removal. Uh, you know, normally you can't actually remove devices from a ZFS pool outside of things like a, a log or a cache device. Um, 
but you know, lots of people accidentally added one or two single disks to the end of their pool when they were trying to add a mirror for a cache device or something. Uh, you know, you forget one keyword, and now you've screwed your pool forever. Uh, so device removal allows you to remove uh, a top-level VDIV as long as it's a single disk or a mirror. It doesn't let you remove a rate Z yet, because that turns out to be really complicated. Uh, but this way, you can actually shrink a pool, uh, which I think, especially for Delphix, the use case was they had spans from a, a bun, and they, it turns out I don't need all that much space, and that space is really expensive, so I'd like to give one of those back. We're also like migrating to newer set of tests. Yeah. Uh, so this works by basically uh, maintaining a, a, a map file and just relocating the data to one of the devices you're not removing, uh, and then uh, over time, as you update that data, the mapping goes away. Uh, so it takes a little bit of memory, uh, but not that much energy. Uh, the Z pool checkpoint. Uh, this one is really nice if you're building some kind of appliance. Uh, basically, what a checkpoint does is take a copy of the Uber block and stash it. Uh, so in that Uber block at the very top of the big tree of blocks that makes up ZFS. Uh, and the other thing it does is make sure that you never actually free any space. Uh, so what a checkpoint allows you to do is once you have a checkpoint, any ZFS operation you do can now be undone. So it can, uh, because you just go back to the blocks how they were before, uh, and because you never free anything, you never overwrite anything. Uh, but it means you can undo things like renaming a data set, destroying a data set, uh, or most other changes you might make. Uh, the idea here is if you're going to, say, do an update on an appliance, and this involves, say, updating the database to a new schema or something, you can checkpoint the pool, do your upgrade. If it fails in the middle, you don't have to write some kind of script to try to undo only the parts you've actually finished or something. You can just re-import the pool at that checkpoint, uh, and the pool's back to exactly how it was. Can that roll back feature block? Yes, it can undo an upgrade right now. Yep. Yeah, so it can even undo oh. Z-Pool upgrade. Oh. Because it's the Uber block from before, and we just never, we make sure we never free any space, so we never overwrite anything. Uh, so they're not meant to be kept around for long, because you will run out of space, because it's basically uh, uh, even more than a whole pool snapshot, because it can even undo renames and upgrades and everything. But they're super useful for upgrading an appliance, because you can undo a Z-Pool upgrade, you can undo a Z-Pool ZFS destroy on a data set. <coughs> or you know, if you rename the old database out of the way and install the new database, you can just undo it and everything's exactly how it was before. Instead of trying to write an upgrade script that can undo things. Can you tell the new loader that uh, until I tell you that the new system is good, you should move from this path, this old check, checkpoint? Uh, the checkpoint is you either import it read only, or when you import from the checkpoint, it undoes everything you've done since the checkpoint. So you wouldn't want to do that in the bootloader. Well, I, I, I was thinking if, if your system crashes in the middle of, of your, your process of, mm -hmm. of updating things, then you can't boot it. Right. Then how, how do you go and tell it that you want that whole checkpoint? Yes. Uh, it is something we should look at adding to the bootloader. Uh, because yes, being able to undo a Z-Pool upgrade that then doesn't work with the bootloader even uh, is somewhat useful in itself. Uh, I think Marius brought that up with the, the boot code working group we had uh, earlier this week. Um, but yes, I'm not sure how complicated, I guess it wouldn't be that complicated yeah, to boot from the checkpoint. Yeah, it shouldn't be that hard. Yeah, so you just have to, like, where the... you just choosing which Uber block. Yeah, yeah, just choosing which Uber block, so you just ignore the one it says in the label and use that one instead. So yes, we should be able to do that. Uh, and somebody should do that. Uh, and then uh, at lunch, Matt talked a little bit about Z-Pool initialize, uh, but this basically goes through all of the unallocated space in a pool and writes a pattern to it. Uh, the original use case for this was thin provision storage from Amazon. It turns out the first time you write to a block on an EBS volume, it takes longer because Amazon has to go allocate that block and find somewhere to put it and then give you that address. Uh, so this allows you to write to all of the blocks you aren't using and make them thick provision. I'm sure Amazon actually doesn't appreciate that. <laughs> uh, 
The new space map encoding means that uh, you can deal with really large hard drives better and just, I think it's fewer IOPS every time you want to write some data. This is really precursor to the, um, the space map blog thing. I, the space map blog, which will solve the IOPS. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, channel programs, which Matt talked about last year, I think. Two years ago? Yeah. Uh, which basically lets you do a bunch of ZFS administration options as one unit uh, using the ZFS scripting language is based on Lua. Uh, so really useful if you want to do a, a whole bunch of things all as one unit. Uh, and also just, if you're doing a lot of ZFS administrative operations, each one has to sync before you can do the next one. This lets you do all of them as one transaction. And then the large DNode feature, which is mostly a feature from Linux, uh, but it was important that FreeBSD have support for that so that it can import pools created with that feature flag uh, from Linux. Uh, then there's the features that are available on some platforms. Uh, most of these are not available on FreeBSD yet, uh, but are in the testing image. Uh, the native encryption, so that you can encrypt individual data sets with different keys, and be able to send to a, a replication that's encrypted, so the, you know, the other FreeNAS you're backing up to can't ever read your files. Uh, the multi-import protection, which is a feature I was interested in, uh, the idea is if you have a shelf of disks with two or more servers connected to those disks, it's a way to make sure that you don't import the pool on more than one machine at once. Basically allows the slave node to make sure uh, the other node doesn't have the pool imported before it does the import. Uh, so you don't kernel your file system. Uh, we also have allocation classes. This is basically a new VDEV type called special uh, and allows you to say, Here's an SSD, but only put the metadata on it. So you can have your big blocks of video or whatever uh, on your hard drive, uh, and just the metadata on the SSD, or only small blocks. I mean, I, you can say only uh, allocations of less than 16K should go to the SSD, and all the big ones go to the spinning grass. Uh, parallel mount that is on FreeBSD allows basically, when you're like me and have hundreds or thousands of data sets, being able to map more than one at a time during boot, so it doesn't make booting take forever. Uh, very useful. Uh, the zpool sync command, which is basically uh, a way to say, you know, make sure all the data that's in flight is actually written to disk before this command returns, uh, so that, you know, something you can do before. Uh, great for, for example, you have a VM running ZFS, and you want to take a snapshot on the storage underneath of it, you can basically have it coalesce its, its in-flight data. The new trim, uh, the ability to restart a resilver, uh, and then an extended attributes, which is a, another Linux specific feature. Uh, some other stuff is coming up. Uh, fast clone deletion, that was presented at BSD CAN again one or two years ago. Uh, if you want to know about that, the space map log is kind of related to what Matt and I were just mentioning, which is as you're allocating space, uh, doing that in a log format instead of I know it's not a bitmap, but whatever the, the tree structure it is now, uh, means it's much faster to, to take care of those, and means you have to write less data to the disk every time you allocate data, keep freeing up more IOPS for your actual workload. Uh, like I said, removing the data one. Uh, redacted send and receive is a way of backing up data, but excluding certain data from the replication. So you have a whole data set, so you want to blank out certain bits of information so it doesn't get replicated. And in your case, it's uh, removing personally identifiable information from a database before backing it up, or cloning it so that developers can work on a copy of your production database, but with all the identity information removed. Uh, the set standard compression, uh, per VDEF properties, and the other one we've been talking about is enabling compression by default. Uh, you know, if you use the FreeBSD installer, it enables compression by default, and as does FreeNAS, but if you just do zpool create, it defaults to compression off, and you probably don't actually want it that way. And if you do, you can still do it by changing the default to on. Some future features that are in the work include uh, RAID Z expansion, which Matt talked a little bit about, and hopefully there'll be a call for testing on that <coughs> relatively soon. Uh, DRAID, which is distributed parity RAID, really good if you have on the order of 100 or more disks, and don't want lots, some of the disadvantages of having a lot of really wide RAID Z stripes. Uh, the persistent L2 arc, 
Currently, if you reboot a machine with an L2 arc, when it boots back up, we treat the L2 arc as empty and have to fill it up again. Uh, this, but because the arc, the L2 arc depends on having uh, headers in the arc saying, oh, this data is actually on this SSD. Uh, this would allow us to read the data that's in the L2 arc uh, back so that on boot we'd be able to you know, go find what's on the L2 arc and put those pointers back in place so that you can have a warm cache even after a reboot. Uh, and then one that I'm interested in is adaptive compression. Uh, when I finish adding Z standard compression to ZFS, it'll have support for more than 20 different levels of compression, ranging from many gigabytes a second down to like single digit megabytes per second levels of compression. Um, and you might want to be able to say to your system, compress as much as you can without slowing things down. So the idea is uh, looking at the amount of dirty data there is, how much data is, has applications asked us to write to the disk, but we haven't finished writing yet because we're still compressing it or the disks aren't fast enough or whatever. Uh, as that data starts to stack up, we'll keep lowering the compression level until we get it all through. But when your system's not busy, the compression level can go back up and you'll get as much space savings as you can, but without uh, killing the performance uh, of your workload. And then Smart Compress is a feature from Nexenta, which says it allows you to look at at the file level. Uh, every time we're writing to this file, turns out every block we've written to this file so far has not managed to compress. You know, we tried to compress it, found that the compression wasn't good enough, and thrown it away. Because uh, you know, it's a .tar .exe. Of course, it's not going to compress. Or it's a video file. It's not going to compress. So Smart Compress can say, all right. We give you 100 chances and you've never managed to compress a block on that file, so we're not going to keep trying. Although, it's once every 100 or 1,000 blocks, it will try one in case that file starts having something written to it that is compressible. But basically it says, it detects files that don't seem to have a pattern of ever compressing and avoids attempting at every single block, uh, allowing you to free up some of the cost of having compression for everything turned on. So what it does is send it uh, to the compressor, but with an output buffer that's 12.5% smaller, which is the minimum amount of gain before we decide it's not worth it. Uh, and so as the compressor starts compressing it, if it notices that there's not going to be enough room to finish the block, it gives up early. Uh, so it always tries, but it just gives up early. We should look at that. There, uh, it does one of those. If the whole block is all zeros, it writes it as a whole instead of as a, a block. But uh, yeah, doing something quick like that uh, might actually be quite valuable as well. Let's talk offline. Though. Yes, thank you. Um, and then we have our wish list. Quick question on the, oh, the adaptive compression. How yep. does that affect on the read? Is it um, with, uh, I targeted this for Z standard first. Z standard's decompressed speed on the uh, representative CPU uh, is always at least 800 megabytes per second for decompress. So even on the higher levels, no matter how much tighter you compress it, the decompression is always still fast. Uh, so you know, 800 megabytes per second is not as fast as LZ4 of decompression, mm -hmm. but it's usually sufficiently fast enough that 800 megabytes per second per core will be much more than your disks can deliver the compressed version yeah. into it. Uh, so it's not going to be a bottleneck. Uh, so wish list uh, at uh, the OpenZFS Developer Summit, Matt explained how someone could rewrite GU to make it not stop. Uh, we also talked about the concept of offline DU, being able to dedupe not as you're doing it, but kind of outside, or possibly even 
with the pool exported and doing it differently or something. Uh, <coughs> cases where it might be easier to do this if we can guarantee nothing's going to try to change while we're doing it, things like that. Uh, I was talked to another developer about the concept of being able to do file cloning. So rather than clone a whole data set, being able to clone just one file uh, could be super useful for VMs. Uh, right now, I make sure each VM has a different data set, so I can just do it that way. Uh, but lots of people have made the mistake of not doing it that way, or are doing uh, exposing NFS to VMware, and it's writing all the images in that one thing. So being able to clone at the file level would be very interesting. Uh, and, you know, conceptually, anyways, NFS loves sharing blocks, so it should be able to do it, but we just have to figure out the specifics of that. Uh, and then uh, I have on my wish list per data set throttling or quality of service, uh, and actually Marius started talking about that earlier this week, so I am a victim in everything. <laughs> uh, but you know, being able to say, you know, this data set that's going to this VM or this jail can only use up, you know, 30 megabytes a second and, and 500 of my IOPS instead of being able to, you know, if you have a multi-tenant situation, you don't want one workload stealing all your IOPS. Uh, you know, we've talked to a couple different people about possibly doing support for SMR disks, the shingled magnetic recording, uh, where zones of the disk are basically <coughs> penned only in 256 megabyte chunks at a time. Another one where Matt's come up with a kind of a, a whiteboard concept of how you would do it, uh, but somebody needs to go actually do it. Uh, George Wilson's leading effort to try to figure out what to do about the share NFS property. Currently, rather than usually rather than just on, it currently contains you know there's the NFS settings uh, for your OS. And that works fine on FreeBSD, but if you export your FreeBSD pool and import it on Linux or Lumos, those settings aren't actually the same. Uh, and how do we make this useful or make it so that it's uh, you know, share NFS at FreeBSD or something uh, so that you know you don't confuse the Illumos or FreeBSD NFS statement when you try to import a pool from FreeBSD and try to export it over NFS with settings that don't make any sense. Uh, you know, and everybody would love ZFS to be a clustered file system uh, or to have some kind of continuous replication where I could just set up an open pipe and it would just keep sending uh, the replication stream constantly instead of having to do individual snapshots. So you should get involved and help extend and, and make OpenZFS better. Uh, so it's a very active community. Uh, there's a, you can join the OpenZFS Slack or the mailing lists uh, or the monthly calls or even just uh, post issues you find on GitHub or pull requests for features. You know, we're also looking for a volunteer to help take the existing man page and consolidate the bits from the different OSs, the Illumina specific sections and the FreeBSD specific sections, and get it all as one nice man page with if defs or something. And also break up the man page. We'd like maybe each subcommand of ZFS and ZPool should have its own man page instead of the one big man page that's kind of daunting to try to read. Uh, so whether you just want to work on the man page or you want to implement one of the features off the wish list, you should uh, join the community and help out. Any other questions? Chris. I just want to take a second just to give some credit to Matt Mace. He's putting a lot of effort into making this happen. Um, and also the fact that he did some outer tree version for rapid iteration. I know maybe a core was a little unconventional, but uh, it's worked really well. So feel free to give it a shot. If you have feedback, send it our way. We'd be happy to get it. Yes. That was a big lift to do, to basically report ZFS. Yeah. Uh, although, I know it took him longer than Pavel reported the first time, but he probably wasn't working 18 hours a day like Pavel was. Sure. <laughs> Honestly, at this point, we've probably put more man hours into the test than we even. Yes. <laughs> so forth, that was a lot of work to do as well. But, you know, it'll be worth it, and it's, you know, one of the prerequisites of integrating with the existing CI, so on and so forth. Naive question, is there a way of snapshotting No. That would be a cool feature. Turns out more data sets is better. <laughs> if you have the presence of mind to make them beforehand. Yes. But I just, yes. I, I ended up doing a whole bunch of stuff, and it's like, I really don't like what happened here. Yes. So I went to the 
snapshots and I read CP dash Arden. I learned the same lesson. You know, in our in our first, uh, you know, at lunch we talked about you know everybody's oldest SQL, uh, and mine's from 2011, and it has one data set for videos, and every customer has a subdirectory rather than their data set, and so when customer one customer cancels their account, I can delete their terabyte of videos, but unless I want to delete my snapshots, I don't actually get my terabyte of space back. Uh, and that's why on all the newer servers, uh, there's a separate data set for each customer. So when a customer stops paying me, their files go away and I get my space back. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've looked at some crazy things like snapshot it, clone it, delete everything but that directory, and then and then try to send, receive it, or rebase it, or something. But I haven't found the perfect solution yet. I was looking at, not working on. <laughs> yes, but zero copy send file for ZFS. Yes, uh, there's some bits of a design for it uh, from the original Solaris. Uh, Matt and I were talking about earlier in the. Case where the arc isn't compressed, the existing bits could be made to work. Uh, with compressed arc, they'd have to do a little bit more work and basically share the, the linear buffer from the debuff cache instead. But yeah. I don't know. Pos? Any idea? Sure. Using the OS buffer cache rather than the arc? I don't know. Like not using the cache at all? Well, no, no, uh, use the OS buffer cache rather than the ARC so that the existing zero copy stuff can borrow buffers. Yeah. Uh, but basically, the Solaris design is there's a, a VFS operation. You can say, I want to zero copy this block of, uh, range of bytes or whatever, uh, and it will lock that range in the buffer cache and give you a pointer to it, uh, which mostly works. I don't know. Uh, I haven't had time to dig into it. It's on my wish list, but it's not at the top. But uh, definitely would be interested in, in helping make that happen. We have the APFS style file clones, so the GF one three is cheap. Uh, file cloning is on the list. Oh, okay. uh, it's on the wish list, though. It was uh, Tim Chase is who I was talking to about it. I don't know if he's gotten anywhere with it. Uh, Yes, we'd like to have that, because, uh, yeah, stuff like that for Git and databases and other workloads would be super helpful. Hey, Alan, can I add another uh, item to the wish list? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Being able to boot from a read-only pool, as in a pool where the property right, the, is on. So, Is there a pool property for read-only? It's only a data set property, right? You can import it read-only. Yeah. We'd have to teach the bootloader to do a re-import read-only, and that should work. Yeah, that's a bootloader feature, actually, more than a ZFS feature. Yeah. But yeah. I think bootloader is not should not should in any way import read-only. It doesn't care about specific. Right, I guess the, we just need it's a road, road mount for Yeah. Um, Actually, I think you just need one line in your loader.com to make that work. It's like vfs.root.mount blah blah equals ro, and it should work. We'll have to try that sometime. Ping me on Twitter and we'll figure it out. Any other questions? You mentioned lost features in the visuals. Could you elaborate? I don't know. Uh, somebody would like ZMS to be, somewhat, be able to do something. Okay. <laughs> the idea that there was around um, like having a bunch of different nodes of storage attached to how do you appear as one storage pool? I was okay. sure it was one of all the computers. Okay. That's the wish. Okay. But you know, we also wish for a pony and a unicorn. <laughs> World peace and <laughs> so <laughs> like how's D raid looking with Richard and Company? There was a bunch of good. Yeah, there was a, there was a um, working group meeting a couple weeks ago, uh, and there's I think there's.
there's a lot of good progress, and it's pretty close to completion. So I think once once folks really dig into it, it's not not going to be long. Great. There's a DRAID uh, channel on the Slack that has uh, where the working groups have been communicating. Cool. Yeah, not managed to read all of the maps. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Uh, you can check out the books that Michael Lucas and I wrote, uh, ZFS, or FreeBSD Mastery, ZFS, and Advanced ZFS, which you can get off Amazon, or you can get DRM free from ZFSbook.com. There's also the FreeBSD Handbook ZFS chapter that uh, Benedict and I wrote. Uh, that a lot of the, a good reference for, I have a failed disk, how do I replace it? Or I want to do, uh, ZFS replication over SSH as not root. How do I do that? All that kind of stuff's there. And you can also check out uh, bsdnow.tv, which is our weekly, not going to be video anymore, podcast, uh, where we answer, talk about the news in BSD and ZFS, and also answer user questions about those. And you can always ping me at Alidude on Twitter. I believe the free BSD Mastery book is also. Yes, you can buy a copy in the hallway if you want, and I'll even write something funny in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you.